Hi, everybody, and welcome to an extra special episode of True Consequences podcast. I'm your host, Eric Carter Londeen, and today I'm joined by a friend of mine, somebody who I admire so much and have so much respect for, Julie Murray. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Eric. It's so good to see you, and I'm so glad that we decided to do this. Me too. It's been a while. I think it's been since the summer of last year that we saw each other in person. But we stay connected as much as we can. We're both pretty busy people. Julie, can you take a moment and just introduce yourself? Introduce, if you'd like, your sister's case a little bit. Give us a summary, and then we'll get into our conversation. Yes. Again, thank you for inviting me on. It's an honor to connect. I'm so glad that we do have this community where we can meet people that can empathize with our situations. And you are certainly one of them. So I'm Julie Murray. I'm the sister of Mara Murray. Mara is a missing person. February of 2004, my little sister Mara, she was a nursing student at the University of Massachusetts. And on a Monday, she decided to turn in her nursing school homework at about 3.30 in the morning. And then she started doing some odd things. She was looking up directions to both Vermont and New Hampshire. And again, this was on a Monday night. She's in school. So that was odd that she was looking up places to go because she should have been in school. So later on in the day, she emails her professors and says that there was a death in the family. And that was not true. And then she does a number of things, um, continues to do internet searches. And she called a condo owner up in New Hampshire. And this was a condo that my family had stayed at before. By all appearances, it looked as if she was making a plan to go to either Vermont or New Hampshire. Now, I will note that she did not make any reservations. She did call, but there was no reservations. So later on, she goes to an ATM. She withdraws $280 from her bank account. And that left just shy of $20 in her account. And then she went to a liquor store and she purchased roughly $40 worth of alcohol. And she also returned 79 cans for $3.95. So also a little odd. And then she gets into her 1996 Black Saturn sedan running on three cylinders and starts to head north. And destination unknown, she didn't tell anybody. So then fast forward a couple hours at about 7.30 p.m. in a small rural town in New Hampshire called Woodsville, a woman notices a dark sedan off the side of the road in the wrong lane facing the wrong direction. So she was in the eastbound lane and the car was twisted facing westbound. So she calls 911 and Then a short while later, a bus driver, her neighbor, drives by, also sees the Saturn in this strange position in the middle of nowhere on the side of the road and speaks to the driver, who we have to assume was Mara because it was her car, and asked if she needs help. And the driver, Mara, says, no, I've already called AAA. But the bus driver knew that was not possible because there's still no cell phone service even today in that remote area. So he continues on a short distance to his house and he calls 911 at 742. So that was the second 911 call. Three minutes later, an officer arrives at 746 and he finds the Black Saturn sedan locked and abandoned. And Mara was nowhere to be seen, and she's never been seen again. There was no footprints in the snow. Nothing has ever been found. And so it's been 19 years now, and she's still missing, and we still don't have any answers as to what happened, where she is, what she was doing, nothing. I just can't imagine the desperation and the pain that your family must feel my heart goes out to you. And for those of you that don't know, and I'm sorry to make you have to go through that again, I know that it's not easy to retell the story over and over again. But I think it's important for my listeners to know that you're coming to this conversation in a position that most people never want to find themselves in. And God forbid they ever do, because it is it's a horrible position to be in. 
And part of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you is we've talked about this. We talked about this at True Crime Podcast Festival last year about what it's like to be a family member in this space. And it's some of the things that I know you're advocating for on TikTok and other platforms. I talk about it constantly, either on my show or social media. It's something that I'm really proud of you for standing up and speaking your truth in this realm because it's not easy. People are really cruel sometimes and say and do things that you know, I don't know how we don't completely lose it sometimes. Yeah. But I have so much respect for you because you continue to speak about what's right and what it's like to be in this position. So first of all, before before we go into that, is there anything else you want to say about Mora? If there's anything else, any parting thoughts or Maybe you can direct people to a website or somewhere if they want more information. I will say that I I do believe that Mara's case could be solved. And that is the motivation why I'm still doing this 19 years in. And you can attest to that, that there's that hope that we have to have in order to keep moving forward. So I do believe that continuing to spread awareness and doing things like this and talking about the situation and talking about Mora in a victim-centered way is the best way and the way that we're going to solve this. But I want to draw people back to the fact that we're talking about a real human here. So a lot of times in the true crime realm, these stories are so mysterious and intriguing that we forget that we're talking about not only a real human in Mara who wasn't perfect made mistakes, was 21 years old. But we're also talking about the family and the people that she loved that are left behind in the wake of this tragedy. And we're also real humans and we have feelings. And I think we can't lose sight of that while we're trying to solve this mystery. Because in my experience, sometimes Mara has become a footnote in her own story. So the focus is no longer even on the missing woman at the heart of the story, and it's on other circumstances surrounding the mystery. Yeah. And there's certainly a lot of room to speculate because there are so few answers in my sister's case. So I want to make sure that people understand that when you're consuming these stories, you have to understand that these are humans and not characters. Uh, so that being said, I do have a website where I keep updated, and that's moramariemissing.org. I'm also active on TikTok, on Twitter. My TikTok is moramariemissing, and my Twitter is juliemurray2 underscore nine. And there's also a big Facebook group that I, I run as well. So there's no shortage of ways that people can reach out to me or continue the discussion. Because that is what needs to happen in cold cases. Because if we don't continue to talk, then they just continue to become colder and colder to where they're frozen. And the only way to warm it up is to do things like this and bring awareness to the fact that Mar is still missing. Absolutely. I think you brought up a very important point, something that I've been speaking out against for a while now, which is speculation in true crime. And I think that people get confused as to the difference between speculation and actual theories that have been tested and are being worked by investigators or a private investigator or something like that versus wildly throwing out just things to see what might stick. And I know that, there, like you said, there's a lot of, of room for that in Morris' case, and people have definitely taken liberties because of that. How do you feel like speculation impacts a case, but also impacts the people that are involved or the people that are close to the case? Two main areas. One, when you're talking about a cold case such as my sister, it's one of many. So Mar is not the only missing person just in the state of New Hampshire. The resources are limited in that regard. So the cold case unit is working hundreds of cases. Right. So when you start to sprinkle in some wild, sensationalized speculation, 
it detracts from the very limited resources that the actual investigators have. So they're now running off, chasing down the things that are not based in fact or evidence. And so that's a detractor in terms of trying to get resolution for Mara's case. The other side of that is how harmful it is to the people, the real humans, like I talked about before, left behind in the wake of these tragedies. You can attest to this. We have, when we wake up in the morning, we have a limited, a finite amount of energy to give to that day. And we have to determine how we're going to use our energy, both physical energy and emotional energy, especially this far along. You're, in your case, what, 36 years? Thirty. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, 19. So when we have wild speculation thrown on the internet to see if the spaghetti will stick to the wall, the family members are the ones that have to take on that burden and say, whoa, slow down. That is just hearsay. That is not based in fact. That is not helpful towards the goal here, which is to find Mara. And it detracts from our amount of energy that we could give towards actual investigation efforts or advocacy work because we're trying to control or police or correct misinformation. So that is the secondary harm of misinformation that's just plastered on the internet. It's not helpful. And I will add that I understand, and I can only speak for my situation, in that nobody knows what happened to Mara. So most of what we talk about is just theories, but we have to keep it based in reality and based on the facts that we do know. So a lot of times we have revisionist history in my sister's case where people want to rewrite things because they are locked in on a certain theory and you can't get that stovepipe thinking because then you're ignoring other possibilities and that's harmful to the goal, which is to figure out what really happened. I think sometimes too people could say things that might turn people off from even being invested in trying to help with the case. And if those things are not grounded, in fact, it really does hurt. It it hurts the momentum that you're trying to build. I think both of us have that same mission in mind that we need more people to be aware so that we can get the people who maybe saw something, who maybe heard something, or who maybe have evidence that could help to come forward. And when Somebody saying things that, for example, let's say a teenager runs away from home and goes missing. As soon as you say, oh, that that teenager was trying drugs or was drinking and so they're a bad kid. And then people are like, oh, then they deserved it. Or it's just that's the kind of mentality that sometimes we're dealing with when people are consuming this information. Yeah, that's a very real thing. And I've experienced it in my sister's case where she's called promiscuous. So she's not worthy of additional resources or her case is dark or dangerous. She's a missing human. What are you talking about? It's, oh, I don't want to get involved with the Mara Murray case because somebody might try to trash me online and dig into my past history that has nothing to do with Mara Murray whatsoever. But they're more hesitant to come forward with information or speak out about something that may be significant because they don't want their name associated with it because of all the just sensationalism and the negativity surrounding it, which is unfair to Mara. And that's what it's all about. Nobody should not come forward with information because they're worried that their speeding ticket or DUI charge 12 years ago might hit the the internet yeah yeah it's such a weird a weird thing to be worried about and a weird way to make it about themselves too which i've never really understood that kind of fascination that people have i get being fascinated or trying to understand abnormal psychology or things that are a bit macabre that doesn't bother me but it's this weird obsession and like self-identification that I see sometimes that kind of freaks me out. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. People have written, literally written themselves into my sister's case who have never met her, have never had anything to do with her, but they want to make it about them. 
And that boggles my mind because here I am. I don't have any way out of this. I'm in this and I I don't want to be. I'm not in this because I'm attention seeking. Trust me. I'm not in this for my health. I don't want to be in this situation. But there are other people that want to insert themselves into the worst day of our lives and the worst experience that that could ever happen to somebody. And I get mo- the majority of people want to help. That's great. And they're trying to figure out the best way to help get resolution for Mara. But it's when it turns into being about the person instead of about the missing person that yeah. they're covering where it just boggles my mind that happens. And it's interesting that you say that too, because I think given the opportunity, if I could fix this and make it have never happened, if I could write myself out of this, I would. I never wanted to be here doing this. I never wanted to put my family's dirty laundry out for the whole world to consume. It's not something that I've enjoyed. It's not something that I ever thought I would do. I'm extremely private as a person. I don't like having all of this stuff out there, but it's not about me either, right? It's about Jacob and yeah. it's about what's right for him. And so I would sacrifice all of that, all of my privacy, everything, and my safety for that matter by speaking out about this stuff. And I know you're in the same spot. Like I know that. The, I can't speak for you, but I can just tell this is where we're at. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that because I've met other family members who have said the exact same thing. This was not the plan. It was not part of what I saw for my life. But I don't have a choice now because if I don't continue speaking out, my voiceless missing sister can't do it. So I have to do it and I don't have a choice. And what we touched upon earlier is... We don't get to turn this off. We don't get to go on vacation and relax our mind. We can try, but it's always there. We carry this trauma with us everywhere we go. I can close the laptop and turn the basketball game on, but part of me is still thinking about, oh, I got to run down this. I got to follow up on this. What about this? It's constant for us. And I think that is an aspect of true crime that people don't fully understand. And I think it's important for people like us who are living it to remind people that we don't have a choice. No, it does pervade every aspect of my life. And it's overwhelming most of the time on social media. And I think I first heard you talk about this at True Crime Podcast Festival about engaging with empathy. And then I saw you started building upon that through through TikTok and, and other means. Can you explain to my listeners First of all, what engage with empathy means and why, why should they engage with empathy? I'm just excited to hear you talk about this. Yeah, I have a vast amount of experience in living in the true crime space. And I've found that the best way to approach these cases and the family members and the advocates is just to sprinkle a little bit of empathy in the coverage. And I've, I've seen that it's gotten better. I need to acknowledge that. When I was first thrown into this 19 years ago, it was missing and my family suffered and everybody in my family has been drugged through the mud. I don't, I can't explain it. There's, there is, obviously there's value in looking at my sister's past and looking at how she was raised, but trying to discredit everyone that she loved I don't understand the reason for that. And so I've had significant trauma because of it. And I recognize that there's other people going through similar situations, albeit not as bad as what my family went through early on Mm -hmm. in the early stages of social media. Because like I said at the beginning, my sister disappeared in 2004. We didn't have TikTok. We didn't have all the Instagram stuff. We right. we just really had Facebook. And so now it's easy to just throw shade out there at people on the periphery and ruin people's lives. People that are already struggling with some heavy stuff and trauma and PTSD and things like that. 
Right. So I said, you know what? I need to articulate to people what somebody in my position feels. And so I started the Engage with Empathy campaign. And it's based on the, pr the principle of CARE, which stands for Center the Victim, Avoid Wild Speculation, <laughs> like we talked about, Research responsibly. So do your due diligence. Don't just read something online and say, oh, that's a fact, and then continue to spread it because that's the problem with misinformation, again, like we talked about. And then engaging with empathy. So putting yourself in our position. And I'm not talking sympathy. So there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. So sympathy is, I feel bad for you. I can't even imagine. And empathy is feeling or more so trying to feel what we feel. Of course, no one's going to be able to feel what 19 years and 36 years feels like, but they can try. And what they can do is they can listen. And that's where you establish the connection to, okay, I don't fully understand, but I want to hear what you have to say. I want to listen and I want to acknowledge your experience, your lived experience, so that I can better understand what it does feel like to be in your position. And that is so important. And a lot of times the coverage of these cases lacks that empathetic approach. And I'm not saying by any means that I want to control anything or censor anything. All I'm saying is remember that there's humans behind the story. And I think engaging with a little bit of empathy helps us get back to why we're all here. There's a missing human or there's a murderous human. And that was the impetus for the Engage with Empathy campaign. So that was why I did it, because I've felt the pain of people just coming after my family when we're already traumatized and then having to, again, try to s determine what energy I'm going to use for the day, battle trolls online or talk to investigators and try to find my missing sister. And so nine times out of 10, I am going to put my energy towards my goal, which is to find my sister. But I don't want other families because let's be honest here, there's going to be other tragedies that happen. And you and I are in a position where we have decades worth of experience and we yeah. can share that with other families that are going through similar things. And that's the story behind it. I love it. I think that I think that we should create like an articles of ethics in true crime podcasting and allow people to voluntarily sign up and follow the care model because that's the way I do it. That's the way I report. I research. I rely heavily on first source information. We're doing records requests constantly. Sometimes they're very expensive, but it doesn't matter. It's the right way to do it. Talking directly to the family members, talking directly to the people that are involved and centering the victim, which is something that I feel like, along with the topic of ethics, is starting to become a little bit watered down and a little bit cliche because people can just say that and then think that's what they're doing, even if they aren't, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so I've seen that a lot of times where people will just go on this pontification about what ethics and true crime looks like, and it's all different. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong. It's just a lot of talk and not very much action to show that's exactly what's happening. So I think that CARE is a beautiful acronym. I think it makes so much sense. I start every advocacy-focused episode with the victim, not what happened to the victim, but who they were what they meant to the family, what made them special. There's a, an episode that's dropping tomorrow. This guy was an aspiring rapper on the Navajo Nation. And so his music's through the entire episode because that's who he was. That's what he wanted to be. And it's such a beautiful thing to be able to honor somebody and their story and their history like that. And I don't understand why people don't want to do that because it's just... It's the way it should be done, I think. 
Yeah, it's so true. You see a lot of hashtag ethical true crime. What does that mean? When you and I were in Dallas, we talked about victim-centered. And I think you asked me, what does that mean? And that's the part that's missing. No one's right. defining what these things mean. You can't just throw a hashtag on something and now you're an ethical creator. What are you doing? What actions are you taking? Right. And I think we're, we've made huge strides. Yeah. I think because victims, survivors, and family members, secondary victims, have mm -hmm. banded together, we're seeing the change and we're not asking for much. We are asking for very basic, just I, very basic things. Just treat us with, treat the victims as if they were human beings. That's it. That's all we're asking. We're not telling you not to cover our stories. We're not telling you to ask us permission. We're just saying, just to talk about the facts. Talk about the victim. That's all we're asking. If that's too much to ask, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's the bare minimum that I would expect from just anybody I meet on the street, have some compassion, be respectful, try to be understanding, do your best. I think the main question as it pertains to ethics in my mind is what's your intention with telling yes. this story? Why are you telling it? If your answer is because I'm going to get more clicks, you might not be ethical. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. If your answer is, I want to help this family, or I think that this story is super important to get out there so that people can learn something to protect themselves, or maybe a law could be changed or something, then great, go for it if that's your intention. But the intention, I think, is like 90% of what co constitutes ethical content creation, in my opinion. Yeah, I love the way that you put that. And you and I, we've spoken about this before, the attention versus intention. And that is what's so important. Yeah. Are we talking about this particular information because it's furthering the case or are we talking about it because it's entertaining? And that is the distinction that not only creators, but consumers need to be aware of because a lot of times it, it just in my sister's case alone, there's a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with her disappearance that people find kind of salacious, a little bit entertaining. It makes a better story. Listen, we don't need a better story mm -hmm. with my sister's case. We got enough just based on her timeline alone. We don't need to add in that she may have committed a felony and was involved in a hit and run. My sister has been implicated in a felony offense because there was a young man that was struck by a vehicle in a hit and run three days before my sister disappeared. And there's absolutely no evidence to indicate that Mara was involved whatsoever. Zero. But people have just thrown that out like spaghetti on the wall. Oh, that's interesting. Let's look into that. And in doing so, it's not in good faith. It's not based in evidence. And what on earth does it do to further the case? As Mara's sister, if there was some evidence that implicated her in this felony, absolutely, let's look into it if that's going to help us find Mara. But there right. simply isn't. So why are we talking about it? What is the point? It doesn't do anything to help the case. It cheapens her memory. It makes it seem like they're trivializing her worthiness to be found. And I think that it's 100% wrong to do that. Yeah. And that's just one example. Yeah. I'm sure you have dozens, if not more. Yeah. yeah. I've got quite a few myself of things that people have said to me that just, I'm like, why? What's the point of that? Does nothing, doesn't do anything to help make sure that the person responsible for ruining my family and killing my brother doesn't hurt anybody else because ultimately that's what I want. Yeah. It's not about revenge. It's not about vindication. It's about making sure that nobody else has to go through what we went through. Yep. Beautifully said. That's, uh, and that is it. Period. <laughs> yeah. My gosh. It's just, like I said, I have so much respect for you. I look up to you, honestly. You inspire me to continue fighting 
there are days where I want to give up and I'm sure you have those days as well. And I look at you and I see what you're doing and it's just, okay, if Julie can do this, if Sarah can do this, I can do this, I can keep going and I'm going to be forever grateful to you for playing that part in my life. I echo the same back to you. I remember the first time we met and it was just like, you're my brother. I felt as if I've known you my whole life. Yeah. And it's because of that trauma bond that we have, or that's not the right term, but yeah, our relationship forged in trauma that nobody else can relate to. Yeah. And it's just a natural connection that we have. And we don't even, we didn't even need to say anything. I remember I didn't even say anything. I just freaking hugged yeah. you. And I was like, hey. Hey. And that's what I was alluding to earlier is all of these people that are the ones with the most at stake, the family members, the victims themselves, survivors, banding together and feeling like now we have brothers and sisters who we don't even have to say anything. I sometimes get texts with just a heart from other family members and they get it and I get it and they don't need to say any words. Yeah. I know what they mean and It's just those small little relationships that have made it possible from my perspective to keep going because this is hard stuff. It's, it's not easy. It's funny because somebody had commented, oh, I don't listen to stories involving kids because it's too difficult. And I said, imagine how difficult it is to live it. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's, that's nothing compared to going through it. And I'm not saying that people should force themselves to listen to things that might traumatize them. That's not what I mean, but it's just, okay, yeah, I get it. It is hard. But also to your point, we have to keep talking about this stuff because if we don't, we can't expect it to change. We can't expect it to get better. We can't expect to make progress in these cases. So we have to. We have to. We don't have a choice. And I'm so thankful that I've been able to connect with so many other people feel the same way and I can lean on. I can call you at any time yeah. and just vent and you get it. And the same with so many others that I've met along this journey. That gives me hope. And yeah. that's all we need because I've talked about this before. It's your hope changes over time, especially with a missing person. And in your case where it's been so many years and still no resolution. The only thing that keeps us going sometimes are those connections. Yeah. Is that empathy? And that is what cultivates hope. And that's what we need. My gosh. So beautifully said. It's exactly, it's like you're speaking my mind. It's really (laughs) strange. But it is true. I think that somebody had asked me early on if I had hope about the true crime space changing. And I didn't have hope. But I do now. I do now. So do I. I think that we're seeing, like you said, some great progress, and I think things are going to continue to grow and evolve. The more people talk about this stuff, the more you know we're honest about what's going on, the more self-reflection people can do. I think that for a long time, our trauma, our pain, and being families of murdered and missing people was essentially fodder for gossip. And treated that way in the press and on podcasts and YouTube channels. And there's still some that operate that way. They think it's cute. But it's something that I hope to see go away as a fad and be replaced by care, by empathy, and be replaced by responsible reporting. I think Mm -hmm. those things are the bare minimum, like you said, but also so important to helping move this industry in the right direction. We're, it's happening right now. We're, and we're forcing that change. And we're making it better for the families that are going to come behind us. And you know what? I'll be the first to say, I've made many mistakes throughout the, these 19 years. And other people have too. And that's expected because... Yeah. You're going to make mistakes. This is hard stuff. And there's going to be creators that make mistakes. But it comes back to accountability. So as long as you're willing to admit, hey, I approached that the wrong way, and I'm going to learn from that and fix it going forward. That's, again, all we're asking for. We're not asking for perfection. 
There's, there is no such thing as a perfect person, us included. And right. so all we're asking for is a little bit of accountability to make it better. Yeah. And I think we're moving in that direction. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that sticks in my mind in terms of what makes an ethical creator. People come to me all the time and they ask me like, oh, well, what about this? What about that? And you know, I always say like, look, nobody's expecting perfection out of anybody. I screwed up just like you just said, you know, you've messed up as well. We've all done things in our past, but that's part of life. That's how you grow. That's how you improve. That's how you change. It's when you say this is just how it is and I can't change it. So I'm just going to dig my heels in or even worse, I'm going to start attacking the family for no reason, right? Those things happen. And I know you know that better than most people. It's not about not making mistakes. It's about how you respond when you're confronted by people who say, hey, that probably wasn't the best way to handle it. What's your reaction to that? That is a good indicator of where you lie in, in an ethical construct in my mind. Yeah, because I think with all this talk about ethics and empathy, people are skittish because they don't want to make a mistake. Again, that is not what we're saying. Just if you do make a mistake, which you will, hold yourself accountable. Look in the mirror and admit that and move forward and learn from it so that everybody gets better and this, the true crime space itself gets better. Absolutely. I am so moved and inspired today with this conversation. I really am like so excited that we finally had this conversation because I've been looking forward to it for a while. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this for a while. I just couldn't get my life together. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> so anything else that you want to add to this conversation? Anything else that we haven't talked about that we should explore before we wrap up? I feel good about where true crime is headed and i want to be a part of that true crime yeah because i've experienced the ugly side and i would like to reconcile with people who have did my family wrong and have hurt the image of my sister and we'll see we'll see yeah. that where that goes because i'm not going to sit here and say i'm obviously flawed i'm human and I want people to take accountability for their mistakes and not do it myself. So I am, that's part of my journey that I'm exploring. And I just, I feel good about where we are. Yeah. Me too. I feel really good. I feel very excited. And I think true crime has the potential to do so much good. And it has. And it could do more. Yeah. And I think it should. And I feel like we're heading in the right direction. I feel like people are becoming more aware. And it's thanks to people like us, people like Sarah Turney, people like Mariah Day, who are out there saying, hey, we're here, we're real, and we're not going to put up with you treating us like this. It's not going to do it. It's not okay. And if you think we're going to be quiet about it, you got something coming. And that's the thing, right? Everybody's entitled to do what they want. They're entitled to say what they want, especially in America. We're guaranteed that in the First Amendment. But everyone else is also entitled to react to what you're doing and saying. And so if you think you can do these things with impunity, you can't. <laughs> you're going to get called out on it. And that's only because we have to stand up for ourselves. And hopefully when people are confronted by that, they do the right thing and grow and learn. Yeah, we're not asking for much. We're not, nobody in my family has ever asked for full control over anything in my sister's case. We're just, we're out here on social media being vulnerable. This isn't easy. I know that by doing these podcasts and interviews, I'm making myself a target and I'm already in a vulnerable position and I will be attacked because that's just what happens in my situation. I don't know why. But it's like you said, it's just one of those things we have to do because if we don't do it, who will? So as a consumer of true crime, if you're listening to this, I hope that you found this conversation valuable and informative. If you have questions or you want to talk further about this with either myself or Julie, reach out to us. We're both everywhere, all over the internet, so easily findable. 
Julie, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And I want you to come back sooner than later so we can talk about other stuff. Maybe I'll do a fun show that we can be on together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do something fun for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume you'll be in Austin. So I will. awesome. So I'll see you there. And if you want to see me and Julie in Austin, go to tcpf.com and use consequences to save 15% on your ticket. All right, everybody, thanks for listening and stay safe, New Mexico. Thanks, Eric.